Well, good morning. Uh, we're back to virtual reality for worship service this morning because of the a cold, and we're just hoping that everybody's staying in and staying safe and warm and hoping you're enjoying uh, this Valentine's weekend. A couple of things we want to make you aware of um, since we aren't able to be in person next Sunday, February 21st. Uh, Bill Barker will be joining us in the morning worship service, uh, weather permitting, and be sharing his trip to the Philippines and distributing Bibles. So if you can make it to the uh, in-person service, uh, you can, or you can join us on virtual YouTube and uh, watch Bill speak about his trip to the Philippines. Oh, 
Um, this morning we're in Proverbs chapter six, and chapter six, seven, uh, chapter six and seven form <clears throat> some wisdom literature uh, that uh, Solomon is giving the warnings of wisdom. And uh, chapter five we looked at last week, five, six, and seven all form the wisdom warnings. Uh, this morning we're going to take a look at chapter six. And uh, it breaks into three parts. Um, verses one through five talk about um, surety or, or taking on someone else's debt uh, and, the, and the warning about that. Uh, verses uh, six through 11 uh, talk about work. And then in verses uh, 12 through 19, he talks about the danger of a troublemaker. And he gives warning uh, in all three of these uh, sections about different, different things we encounter in, in real life that we should be warned about. We need uh, some wisdom uh, from on high to help us understand how to deal with these real life situations. And so uh, as we get started this morning, let's just uh, ask God to, uh, Bless uh, this time together, uh, our understanding of his word, and uh, the application of his word to our life. Father, thank you for this time. We pray, Lord, that as we live in a real world, uh, we understand the warnings that you give us. You under we understand the truth uh, to live by and to help us, to give us skill in dealing with people. Also, Lord, we want to take a hard look at ourselves as we read these passages this morning. Perhaps they're pointing out some areas in our lives that need to change, that need to come under your watchful eye, that need to be repented of and, and forsaken. So, Lord, we just pray that your spirit would speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So, right out of the gate in chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, um, here's what uh, Solomon writes. He says, my son, if you become surety for your neighbor, have given a pledge for a stranger. If you've been snared with the words of your mouth, have been caught with the words of your mouth, do this then, my son, and deliver yourself. Since you've come into the hand of your neighbor, go humble yourself and importune your neighbor. Give no sleep to your eyes, nor slumber to your eyelids. Deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hunter's hand, like a bird from the hand of the fowler. So the first section of, of this passage of scripture, verses 1 through 19, the first section, verses 1 through 5, present an interesting situation. Maybe a little background would be helpful. First of all, uh, in Exodus 22, verse 25, lending to a fellow Israelite was to be done without interest. So whatever Solomon's talking about here, the Mosaic law prevented the Israelites from doing that to their own countrymen. Uh, so the idea of, of this being a loan to a fellow Israelite probably isn't in view here. Some uh, commentators believe this is probably brought on by the fact that by Solomon's time, international trade and commerce was becoming an important thing. And so in order to give advice to his own family, uh, Solomon probably is talking about a situation that would occur in his time with business trade. Um, and so with that in mind, uh, there are some specific things to keep in mind as you read verses one through uh, five here. First of all, this is something that is advice. Um, it's not mandatory that you never lend or get involved in an investment, but it's telling you what kind you should avoid and what kind may, what problems may arise from getting into these things. And so with that in mind, he simply says, my son, if you become a surety uh, for your neighbor or given a pledge for your for a stranger. The word neighbor and stranger are basically the same word. 
It really isn't a family member that's in view here, but it could be. It's not, uh, it's not a fellow Israelite there that's in view. It's just somebody uh, that has an investment that they want you to be a part of. And so in verse one, you have the understanding that it isn't that you could or you could not. The picture in verse one is that the person has already gotten themselves involved in the, the loaning of money to this neighbor or some other person. It's not that they haven't yet done it, it's that they've done it. They have become a surety, a guarantor for the debt of this investment. Um, and so Solomon's giving advice on not only in the future what to avoid, but for right now, if you find yourself in this situation, Here's what you need to do. They've become uh, they've become a partner in the debt um, with another person. Not only that, they uh, agreed to it with an informal handshake. In verse two, it says, "If you've been uh, ensnared with the words of your mouth, you've been caught with the words of your mouth." They've given a pledge in the last line of verse one. That means they've shaken hands. So it's an informal type of um, agreement, but it's nevertheless a binding agreement because you've given your word and you are now trapped. It's not that you could be, it's that you've done it and this person is now coming uh, as or Solomon's giving advice as if this person's come to him and he says, now what do I do? How do I get out of this? Well, the first thing he would say is don't get into it. The second thing he says, if you find yourself in this situation, here's what you need to do. And so with this situation, he gives a warning against entering in to or guaranteeing someone else's venture and debt. And that's the idea of surety there in verse one. It's where you become the guarantor of repaying the debt should the investment go bad or the other person doesn't pay off of the loan. Um, and the problem here is that the person's already gotten themselves into the, into the agreement and he's made his commitment. Now, what, he, what does he need to do? How does, he, how does he get out of this? Well, in verse, um, verse two, uh, the damage is done. You've been trapped, you've been snared. And you'll notice that in verse uh, five, it's like either uh, deer hunting or hunting for birds. Uh, the trap has now been entered into. You're already caught. So, Here's what you need to do. And he, and he then tells you uh, in verse uh, three, this is what you need to do. If you find yourself already in this situation, then the best advice he says is get out of it as quickly as possible. Get out of it as quickly as possible. Um, and in verse, verse three, he says, do this then. And he addresses his his son or his sons, his family, and deliver yourself. This is literally uh, a deliverance. It's, it's getting out of a mess that is something you don't want to be in. Uh, and in relation to the investment here with whomever it might be, it's not going well. The person has not been able to pay the debt either back to you or back to another lender also that they brought you in on. And so this is what you do. You deliver yourself. You get yourself out from underneath this, out of this trap. How do you do that? Well, he says in verse three, here's what you do. Do this. Since you've come into the hand of your neighbor, and that's interesting because the word come into the hand of your neighbor literally means you've been now captured. You're now the prisoner of your neighbor, of the person you've entered in, lent the money to. You're now their prisoner. Uh, you've taken on their debt. And for whatever reason, they can't repay it or they choose not to and they've, they've skipped out or whatever the situation is, you're now uh, trapped. And so you go to them and you say, I made a mistake. I was foolish. I need out of this right now. And you don't care what the person you lent the money to says about you or to you or what they think about you. The point is you get yourself out from underneath being captive or prisoner to them. How do you do that? 
since you come into the hand of your neighbor, the word come into the hand means to grasp or captivate the hand of your neighbor, go humble yourself. The word humble yourself is interesting. Some people look at that word and, and think it literally means to get down on the ground and beg and grovel before the person to be released from the debt. What happens if you become surety for somebody and they don't pay the debt and they can't repay the debt? It means you are going to pay the debt off and you're going to do it as quickly as possible. Uh, and so there he, in verse three, he simply says, get yourself out of the grasp of, of the debt and of the uh, person you lent the money to. And even if that means you got to endure all the bad things somebody may say about you, uh, even though it may be unfounded and unjust, get out from underneath the debt as quickly as possible. And so in verse, verse three, he simply says, it's, it's getting free of the debt. How do you do that? You go humble yourself, beg, grovel, admit your foolishness and in getting into the agreement. And then if they can't pay, you're going to have to as best as you can as quickly as you can. Get out from underneath it. Verse four, rather interesting. He says, don't procrastinate on this. Don't put it off thinking it'll get better. Don't put it off thinking something else might happen. He says, give no sleep to your eyelids. And that's just the momentary first shutting of the eye for rest your eyes a minute. No, don't even do that. And don't lay down and go to sleep. Don't think about it overnight and see what you're going to do. Get out of it as quickly as possible. And he says in verse five, he, he says, literally, this is a picture of what you are. You are like a deer who's trapped uh, by hunters. And you're like a bird caught in a bird uh, in a fowler's trap. You're trapped. Get out from underneath it. Uh, and so he simply says, uh, first of all, to the lender, get out of it as if you if you can avoid it, don't get into it. Get out of it as quickly as you can. And that may involve humbling yourself, literally begging yourself for the way out. And the best way to get out of a trap like that is never to get into it. So do all you can as quickly as you can to be free of this arrangement, including going to your neighbor and letting the neighbor know no matter what they think of you, you need to get free of the debt. And so in these five verses, you have the first warning, the warning of, of becoming surety, taking on a debt that you can't afford. Uh, even if you may know the person or, or know about the investment, anytime you enter into a debt by your own free choice, you become the prisoner of the debt and the person you've involved yourself with. Word to the wise, he says, is simply this. If you can avoid those situations, do it. Well, what about the person who needs help? Help them. See, the point here in this passage isn't helping the needy because you would give them what they need. The point here is taking on an investment or a debt that is simply a venture in, in investment of some kind that you don't know the outcome of and you can do something about. It's not talking about not helping the needy because you would give what you can out of your resources to do that. So the point here is this is discretionary investment. This is a discretionary business venture. And you need to ask yourself, can I afford this? Would I be happy to give this? Would I be cheerful to give this? Is this necessary? Now then he moves on to the next warning in verses six uh, through 11. And now he doesn't talk to a family, to his family directly. He just simply starts in with the illustration uh, in verse six. Uh, he says, go to the ant, O sluggard, and observe her ways and be wise, which having no chief officer or ruler, um, prepares her food in the summer, gathers her provision in the harvest, how long will you lie down, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Your poverty will come in like a vagabond and your need like an armed man. 
So he moves from debt to work, from surety to now labor in these verses, verses six through 11. And so immediately Solomon, the, the wisdom giver and the warning using wisdom as a warning says, here's something else you need to watch out for. You need to watch out for the sluggard. Now it's interesting. He doesn't name son, watch out for this kind of person. He may be thinking of someone in his family, someone he knows. He may be thinking of himself. So the fact that he doesn't say, son, watch out for this person, tells us that this could apply to anybody, including us, including myself, including all those around me. He says, watch out, don't become like a sluggard. And so he, he gives a warning. Who's the sluggard? What is a sluggard? The word sluggard literally means to be slow or lazy. And so he, he, he's giving a warning about the sluggard. And, he, and he's going to give us an illustration from the insect life on what a sluggard doesn't look like. And we'll get to that in a little bit. But here are three things about a sluggard. Number one, he won't make up his mind. Verse nine, if you look at verse nine in your Bibles, how long will you lie down, O sluggard? And when will you arise from your sleep? That's a direct question to the sluggard. And he doesn't answer. The sluggard can't answer because he's thinking about it while he's resting, not doing what he could do. It's, it's a case of little compromises that lead to wasted opportunity. Little compromises that lead to wasted opportunity. So the first thing the sluggard won't do is he won't make up his mind. Second, the sluggard will not finish things. Over in chapter 26 and verse 15, it says that the sluggard is so lazy, so slow that he puts his hand into, into the dish, but he can't draw it out and get food to his mouth. He won't finish a task. He won't finish things. And then the third thing that a sluggard won't do is that a sluggard will not face things as they are. In chapter 22 and verse 13 of Proverbs, the sluggard says, I can't go outside because there's a lion in the street or there might be a lion in the street. Again, a sluggard makes excuses for not doing what he needs to do. And so those three things are indicators of sluggard mentality or of things to watch out for around people when it comes to labor and work. They won't make up their mind, they don't finish a task, and they're always making excuses. Now then, what can we learn from the illustration that, that Solomon gives here of, about the sluggard an insect itself, a slug, and then an ant, also an insect, but entirely different, entirely different. <clears throat> so the father introduces an instructor or a teacher. And if you look in verse um, six, he says, observe, the second line he says, observe or consider the ant's ways. The problem isn't that, that the sluggard doesn't think about things, it's that he doesn't do anything. And so he's saying, get beyond your thinking about doing it and do it. And he says, go to the ant and consider, watch her ways. And the first thing he says to the sluggard about work is this, that he, he can learn from the ant is this. The ant has inner motivation in verse seven. Verse seven tells us that the ant has no chief, no officer or ruler. In other words, there's no boss telling them to get up and get at it. There's no one standing over the shoulder of the ant and telling it to work. The ant has its own motivation from within to do everything necessary to take care of itself. And he says, the first thing is inner motivation that you can learn from the ant. You can learn inner motivation. That's what gets the ant up and going. It is self-motivated. Then in verse, the next thing we can learn from the ant as our teacher is this. Hard work, verse 8. 
It simply says she prepares her food in the summer. First of all, she looks to the future and knows that what she does now will make a significant impact on the future and on her well-being. So she always looks to tomorrow for her labor today. Because you never know what tomorrow will bring. Who of us would have thought in January of 2020 that in March of 2020, we go into a lockdown and our way of life would change immediately. And it's still enduring. Who would have thought that? And now looking back on it, what would you have done differently knowing what you know now? That's the point in verse eight, hard work. She starts in the summer preparing. She starts early and works looking for towards the future. Hard work. She starts now because the second line of verse eight is what's going to happen next. She plans now looking to the future. Then the future comes in verse eight or the second line of verse eight and gathers her provision in the harvest. What she does now affects the future. And in the future, when it's time for her to harvest what she's brought in and use it, it's there. It's available. One of the interesting things about an ant is it can carry up to 400 times its body weight. Now, that may sound gigantic, but an ant doesn't weigh that much, and 400 times its body weight isn't all that much weight. But it's still hard labor. And the ant exerts the energy and the planning and the looking to the future to take care of today what she will need for tomorrow. And so in verse 9 or in verse 8, she gathers a provision in the harvest. What she prepares and plants in the first line, she reaps and harvests and brings in in the second line. We've already looked at verse 9, which is, is the, the direct question to the, to the sluggard. And he's got one more thing to say there in verse 10 and 11. He says, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands. It's interesting, the phrase little folding of the hands means that the, the sluggard has absolutely no intention of working. He's folded his hands, he's done. It's an indication of idleness. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 4, it's, a, it's an indication of idleness, the folding of hands. He's not going to do anything. It isn't his mind that's the problem, it's his flesh. He won't do what he needs to do to take care of himself. And so Solomon's warning here uh, and giving advice is, you know, you want to watch out for those people because they, they won't take care of themselves. And are you that kind of person? And if you are, what do you need to do? You need to go to the ant and learn the value of work, initiative, planning, and storing or saving. And so that's the point there in those verses. He says then in verse 11, what happens to the sluggard? All of a sudden, the winter of discontent, an unforeseen, unexpected event occurs and in verse 11, boom, out of the clear blue, there comes poverty. A disaster strikes, like a stranger breaking in and stealing everything you've got. Like someone coming with, with a shield or a sword and robbing you. All of a sudden, the event occurs and it's, everything's gone. You're not ready. And so in this section, the uh, Solomon gives us the warning of, and the wisdom of watch out for the attitude of the sluggard. And then finally, in the third section of this, of this uh, passage then is a, a warning about troublemakers. Troublemakers. These are, and the interesting thing about this section here is that he starts out by saying this is a worthless person in verse 12, line one, a worthless person. Literally translated, it means a, a worthless human being. It can be man or woman. But it, 
It's the characteristics that describe this person that he's warning against. And we all know that nobody is absolutely worthless. The grace of God can change anybody, whether it's somebody who gets themselves in an unnecessary debt, somebody who is slow and lazy and doesn't see the value of labor, or it's somebody who's constantly, by the characteristics of their life, always causing trouble for other people. And that's just their bent. That's their character. That's their heart. That's what they enjoy in life doing. That's what the worthless person here is. And the word worthless means without benefit, profit, or use. So they basically, this kind of a person, human being, basically lives to stir up trouble. He's a troublemaker, or she's a troublemaker. And that's the situation that he's describing here. And he doesn't even, he talks about this person in the third person, that person, that person. Now, here's the interesting thing. Here's the question that everyone should ask. Am I that kind of person? Are these traits consistently what I look like to other people? Because we can all be troublemakers. The point is, in this passage, is when you encounter somebody who is consistently, continuously like this, you ought to, as much as possible, steer clear. Steer clear of that kind of person. Don't adopt their lifestyle. Don't adopt their ways. Even if it looks like they may be getting ahead or getting what they want or getting what you might want. In the end, you'll see in a little bit the danger of it. So first of all, in, in the first line of verse 12, he says, this, is, this person is a, a worthless person. It means somebody who, who is without benefit and it's a human being. The word person is is the word for human being in the Hebrew there. So it can be male or female. And what does this person look like? And these are the small things. These are, in verses 12 through 15, these are the small things that, that characterize this person. And it, he, he, he simply says this, this worthless human being is a wicked man, a wicked person. Now, the word man there is literally the gender term, man. And so he goes, he goes into illustrating this worthless person as a man. And he says, this is what they do. First of all, is the one who walks with a perverse mouth. Uh, the word perverse means crooked. Crooked or distorting. First thing about a per this kind of person is they distort truth. Not only do they distort it, they distort it in such a way as to lead a person off on a crooked path, a crooked path. And if you want to see the interesting point of a crooked path, read Psalm 119. Psalm 119, the writer simply is a follower of Jesus Christ, and he says, the last thing I want to do is get off of the good path and get on the wrong path. And this person's sole bent and sole purpose is to see how many people he can get off on the wrong path. So first of all, there in second line of verse 12 is that he walks with a perverse mouth. Walks means conduct of life. It means this is the way he lives his life. It's his character. Second, first line of verse 13, he winks with his eyes. He squints. He squints with his eyes. He kind of, you know, rolls an eye or, or winks like that. It was a subtle means of communication of disdain disdain for something or someone. So he winks uh, his eye. Um, and it's kind of interesting because he uses all parts of his anatomy uh, to be a person who is trying to steer people off the, the path of, of right and what wisdom. So he's winking his eye. Uh, he, very subtle. He taps with his feet. He signals with his feet. It, if he can't get you with his mouth, if he can't influence you informally with the eye, then he's tapping his feet or he's, he's kicking the dust or he's doing something to let you know um, what he thinks. Um, maybe he's stomping his feet uh, in, in standing and having in a conversation. 
he'll use whatever means he can to get people off of the off of the beaten path and and onto a crooked path, off of the good path onto a crooked path. He signals with his feet. He points with his fingers. Uh, it's interesting because I was always taught you never point at anybody, but this guy, this person, has no problem singling out people they don't like, singling out behaviors they don't care for. That person, it, it, it's finger pointing, and this person lives to point the finger at somebody else. And so that's another way that he distracts people, influences people. He points the finger. Uh, another thing that he does there in verse um, in verse 14, the first line, who with perversity in his heart continually devises evil. I think the verse 14, the first line gives you the key. This isn't a, a once in a great in a blue moon situation. This isn't once once in a while or even an occasional. This is all the time that he does all these things. This is the bend of his heart. Notice in verse 14, it says that it is in his heart that he devises continually evil. Uh, and so he's, he's constantly uh, pointing out and continually sowing discord, devising evil. The word evil means bitterness or harm. His intent is to do harm to people, no matter who it is. His intent is to hurt them, to harm them to bring bitterness into their life. Uh, in his heart, he continually devises, engraves. The word devises means to engrave or to plow. It's planted in his heart and he, he chisels it into his heart. Uh, it's, it's just part and parcel of everything he thinks and does, or she. Who with perversity in his heart continually devises evil, who spreads strife, sows discord. The word that 14 line, verse 14, the second line, and verse 19, the second line, share the same statement. And they literally marry those two concepts of verses 12 through 15 and 16 through 19 together. He sows discord. The word sows means to spread. It's the picture of somebody taking seed and going out in the field and spreading by hand the seed to grow. Well, what's he sowing? He's sowing discord. He's sowing discord. And there, discord means untruth. Something that's in, intended to be hurtful and bitter and harmful. And so the bottom line of this character in verses 12 uh, through 14 is that he sows strife. And how does he sow strife? Verses 12 and 13. And 14 tell you how he does it. And he uses all these little small parts, the lip, the mouth, the eye, the hand, the finger, the feet, you know, all these small nuanced things that he does to influence people. Now then, the next thing is because these two pass, this passage 12 through 19 breaks apart between verses 15 and 16. But in 16, the same truth is applied because in verse 19b, you'll see that he spreads strife among brothers. But now it goes from subtle, passive influences to overt, covert action. It intensifies and it magnifies. This person without benefit, without profit or use, now ramps up how he spreads, sows discord, hurt, harm, bitterness out among surrounding people. And so he sows discord. The last line of verse 19 is the key to understanding verses uh, 16 through 18. A. And the last line of verse 19 says, and one who spreads strife among brothers, just like the last line of verse 14b. Same person in mind. Same situation. And so to understand verses 16, 17, 18, and the first line of 19, we have to understand that verse 19b is the key line there. Because the key line, he sows discord among brothers, 
The other verses are going to tell you how he does that, how he does that. Just like in verse 14b, the previous verses tell you how he sows discord. And so he continues on here in this warning about troublemaker. He says, watch out, because they sow discord. They spread lies, falsehood, hurt, bitterness. All those things are wrapped up in the word discord. And so what's, what are the things that, that he says here in, in this next section? There are six things that the Lord, Lord hates. Yes, even seven. Two things. Number one, that, that line, those two lines tell you that six is a cardinal number and so is seven. It means they're important things, but they're not exhaustive. Because nowhere in this passage does he list greed or adultery or a host of other sins. What he's saying is, this is characteristic, but it's not all there is to this kind of a person. And so he simply says this, line, the last line of verse 19 is the key to understanding the six things and the seven things that the Lord hates. And literally, it is Yahweh hates these things. And the question to ask is, do I love the things the Lord loves, or do I love the things the Lord hates? Because this person, these people, hate what God does not like. They literally love what God does not like. They literally hate God. That's what they're saying there. So here we go. Verse 12, or verse 16. There are six things which the Lord hates, seven which are an abomination to him. The word abomination means disgusting, or it literally means the picture of somebody throwing up. It makes him sick to his stomach. And these are six things that literally are disgusting to the Lord. He hates them. Do not love what the Lord hates. Love what the Lord loves. So here he goes. Verse 17, haughty eyes. The word haughty means exalted. It's the eyes that always look up and out at everybody in disdain. It's the eyes of arrogance. They are easily recognizable. They are easily recognizable. Haughty eyes, exalted eyes. The main focus of the eyes there is the person themselves. They're looking out for number one, themselves. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue. It's a, the word lying means deception or deceitful. The only thing that comes out of their mouth is either a half-truth or no truth at all. And their main purpose is to lead you astray, to deceive you, to get the best of you. A lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. The idea, the word shed means to pour out or spill. And it's the idea of hands that are bloodthirsty. They kill. They literally spill blood, take human life. They spill, the spilling of blood means to pour out. Wanton murder, wanton murder. And of course, Jesus expands on that where he's talking here in this line about somebody who literally uses their hands to accomplish murder. Jesus expands on that in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, if you hate in your heart, your brother, you've committed murder. So it's any form of extreme hatred that goes almost and even up to the point of taking the life with your own hands. But it's also hating the life so much you want to see him dead. Murder, spilling of blood, pouring out blood. There in verse 17, a hands that shed innocent blood. Verse 18, line one, a heart that devises wicked plans. What an interesting thing. The heart is engraved. That's what it word devise means again. The heart is engraved with the purpose of committing wickedness, of causing trouble or bitterness for other people. Their sole purpose and all their plans engraved in their heart is simply to become a problem for everybody else, to bring trouble or bitterness into their other people's lives. Interestingly enough, what they sow, they also sow in their own life, as we'll see in a little bit. Then the next line, he says, a heart that devises wicked plans and then feet that run rapidly to evil. There's no hesitation. They 
quickly, rapidly pursue their purpose and plans. And if they see something else that's new that they haven't thought of that inflicts pain and suffering, they're quick to adopt that too. Their feet run rapidly to evil. And then the last thing in verse 19a, a false witness utters lies. It's literally anything that comes out of their mouth because the word utters means to blow out or to exhale. Literally, every breath they take and exhale out, they are uttering either a lie, falsehood, or deception. A lie, falsehood, or deception. And it's deliberate deception. The interesting thing about lies and falsehoods there is that it has a sense of deliberateness. They intend to do harm, deceit, deception. They care nothing about the truth. They care nothing about the well-being of anybody they hurt. They care only that they get in, stir up the trouble, and then watch everything fall apart. So Paul, or, so Solomon gives us here warning, warning about unnecessary debt, warning about work and how our attitude towards it, and then warning about a troublemaker. So in this section of the wisdom literature here in chapter 6, verses 1 through 19, he gives us these warnings. And again, as we look at verses one through five and, and taking on unnecessary debt, the question may be, if I'm in it, what do I do? Get out of it quickly. If I have an opportunity, should I take it? Can I afford it? Can I give it cheerfully? And is it necessary? In the section on, on the sluggard, basic question to ask is, does that reflect my attitude towards work? Does it ad reflect the attitude of my employers towards work? Does it reflect my attitude towards my own taking care of my own things and my work, my personal work, my home, my family? Problem with a, uh, with a sluggard is he's a procrastinator. He always puts it off. He never makes up his mind. He can't finish things, and he doesn't face things as they really are. He always makes excuses. Then the troublemaker. Watch out. Troublemakers can use subtle tactics, the wink of an eye, the pointing of a finger, crooked, deceitful speech, or they can be covert and right in your face. They intend to do harm. They don't care who it hurts. They're out there simply spreading trouble, bitterness, and iniquity, sin, to the lives of others. Verse 15, I left to the last for this very reason. Because the troublemaker, much like the sluggard in verse 11, and the person who gets in unnecessary debt in verse 5, all of a sudden... An event happens, something happens, and judgment comes, and they're not prepared for it. In all three sections, the person who gets into the trouble isn't prepared for it. And in verse 15, look what happens to the troublemaker. Therefore, his calamity will come surprisingly. It surprises him. He thinks, what? What's happening? I didn't think anybody noticed. It comes surprisingly in verse 15, and then it comes instantly, suddenly, perhaps your translation says, but the word literally means in an instant. Out of the clear blue, when they least expect it, when they think they've gotten away with it, boom, instantly, he will be broken. Here's the tragedy of a troublemaker, is that he's wrecked, he's ruined. And in verse 15b, the second line, he's, he's broken, he's, he's ruined, he's wrecked. And the problem is at that point, he can't be cured. He can't be put back together. It's the old nursery rhyme, Humpty Dumpty, sat on a hall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. The word broken literally means healing. 
This person has set himself so much against God that in the end, God gives him what he's sown. The harvest comes in to him. Words of wisdom, words of warning wisdom in these three passages. Hopefully next week we'll be able to get together. We look forward to seeing you then. Be safe, stay warm this Sunday, enjoy Valentine's Day with your family. And we'll look forward to seeing you uh, on the 21st. Again, we remind you, Bill Barker will be joining us and sharing his trip to the Philippines. And also we wanna remind you that on this Wednesday, the 17th of February, Lenten season begins with Ash Wednesday, a time of personal reflection, of prayer and repentance. God bless you. Let's pray as we end. Thank you, Lord, for this words of warning wisdom in the areas of life we so freely move in, our finances, our work, and our community, those around us. You call us to love our enemies, love those that hurt us, even as you did. But even as you did, you distinctively lived a life of wisdom, of distinctive differences, both in the way you treated others, in the way you did the work you were given to do by your father, in the resources allotted. So Lord, help us to be wise in your wisdom as we live in a world that is hurting. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you. Be safe. We'll see you next week. Serve